Okay, I think it's close enough. Oh, and she, she missed it. Last week, I put my foot deep into the theological pool. I know you were. To try to answer your question. So. The greatest class we've ever had. Oh, sorry. <laughs> yeah, I'll finally get on YouTube. i got to get my new mo- a new monitor so I can get my, uh, my software back again. Anyway, so is life, right? Um, anyway, still in... In our favorite Hebrews, and I, let's see, the conclusion from last week, which I think is a fun conclusion, I'll paraphrase very quickly. So, the reason, one of the reasons they believed the way they believed was because it was the construct that they had, and they had no other arguments about it, but they were realizing there were problems, and so our, our evidence and our argument that resonated, obviously resonated in the time, is Hebrews. So when, you know, um, I, okay, this is good to talk about. We won't get into huge theology or anything like that, but to say this about Hebrews in general, about the Bible, about the New Testament in general, okay, it is so common to us, it's what to us? Yes, second nature, I'm looking for a different word. Um, it's more, it, second nature is good. That implies that we fully, we understand it or we comprehend it. Self-evident. It's understood, self-evident. Self-evident, um, even a more negative word. It's, take it for granted. Yeah. we take Almost. it for granted. We have these beautiful, you know, we have these beautiful books, right, of, of compendums, uh, Bibles, uh, Bible literature. Here's the Bible. Here's the whole Bible with the Apocrypha. Everything. All of it. Right here. Even with notes and stuff in it. It's the New English version. It's a really cool version. But you know what? But what do they say? The most common book in every household today, well maybe not today, but used to be is the Bible and all of them had dust on them. Right? So we have become inured. We have them everywhere. And to us, they're not if we look at Hebrews the way I want you to look at Hebrews, we would look at it as a diamond. It's a diamond among ancient literature. I mean, how much ancient literature is there? I mean, there really isn't that much. I've, I've been able to almost read the entire corpus of ancient literature. There may be more to discover, but there isn't that much. One of the great things about learning Latin and Greek, when people learn Latin and Greek back you know, in their school days, is... The corpus was relatively small, but it was kind of neat and exciting, and you were actually looking and reading into words that people had written thousands of years ago, right? Thousands. And people that knew Hebrew, they were looking into words that had been written, not thousands, but up to maybe 4,000 years before, which astounded the Greeks. The Greeks saw them like the, like the, the eunuch in Philip, you know, he had his scroll, right? You, how much did he pay, probably pay for that scroll? The price of a 40-acre farm. The price, maybe even more than a 40-acre farm, but I'll, I'll go with at least the price of a 40-acre farm. We're talking about lots of, lots of schmanoli here. We're talking big bucks. And just think, what was his investment in it? So he pays for it. And I don't know, I, I'm not for sure if the Hebrews had book slaves, but how much you want to bet they did? I bet the Hebrews had book slaves just like the Greeks did. They just didn't write about it because they didn't write about that kind of stuff. So he probably got a book slave with it. How long did it take him to memorize it? You know, the rabbis tested you by the fact, you know, you became a rabbi's uh, student because you went in the circle and I suspect that with the shorter books like Hosea, after maybe one or two recitings, you probably knew the whole thing, right? And your rabbi was happy. But if you're a eunuch that barely knows maybe the Hebrew language and you're trying to memorize a scroll in Isaiah, how long would it take you to do that? This man had probably invested, I, I, I'm going to guess, I'll just throw out maybe a year, maybe, maybe a year of his life, 
invested in, in re learning to memorize the scroll, then what do we do? We got the book of Hebrew. Maybe we read it, maybe we don't. Maybe we study, maybe we learn it. It's cool that we can learn it in Greek or see what the Greek says, but you know, that's rare because there's not a lot of people that, that teach using this method necessarily. And even the university, if you go to university, they don't have the time, the effort, or the ability to take this long to go through it. I've asked you guys before if I should shorten the classes because I have on some others, but you said, no, you don't want me to. So maybe there's some dissonance. That's okay. Um, to me, it's really fun because I'm doing for the first time, I mean, I get to go way ahead of you guys, but... You know, to actually see what does it say in Greek and then to study what the Greek says to me is amazing. Because I wish I could have done that, you know, in that period where you knew Greek, right? Because then you would fully comprehend and understand. Right now, the best we can do is I'm trying to give you the culture and the time and the language. But think about what a diamond it is and each of the books, right? Think about the authors or the... the uh, okay, I condemn many times the translators, they're fair game. But think about it, even the, trans the early translators. How tickled do you think they were to take that work and translate it into their language or into a language, right, and have it ready and prepared and then be able to put it into a compendum finally, right? So we have a compendum which is a masterpiece which GQ says is the most underrated, one of the most underrated texts. Do you hear about that? Yeah. Overrated. Yeah. Overrated. Overrated text. I'm like, okay, the best seller in the whole world from antiquity. And did that mean they didn't read it? Oh, maybe they, maybe they read the Cliff's Notes. You know? I mean, I wouldn't, I wouldn't put it past the GQ guys because they're not very bright, but that's okay. Maybe they read the Cliff's Notes and said, yeah, we, didn't, we find it's kind of underrated. The story's not exciting. You know, obviously they have no clue. But you see... How much of their life have they invested in looking at that text? Okay. Now to us, right, we, we are of the opinion that it's God-breathed. And that is a theological concept, but that is historically theological. And we're not going to go necessarily into that, but that is our opinion. I'd like to show you even more how God-breathed it is, because breath is, well, I think we use the wrong word. Breath would be nefesh, right? It's God panuma. It's panuma. It's ruch. It's the it's the the awful breath of God. <laughs> Maybe to some it's the bad breath of God, right? In any case, in any case, we're looking at here's the words of the day. I think these these are really interesting words. Here's M E S I T E S, masitas, masitas. Mesitas means, what's really interesting about this word is it means amid. Remember the mesos and meta, amid. But in this case, it's a noun that means a go-between, or an intercessor. It's translated a mediator. Uh, I was saying about that because the translation that we had in, I think, the second reading talks about Christ as a mediator. I think it's uh, maybe in, in maybe the John one on the gospel. But in any case, I don't think it uses this same word, but this is a very interesting word to use. This becomes from, from a mid, and it also, the word itself relates in Greek to, remember the mesocline? I've talked about the mesocline, which is the separation in the temple on the outside, which is a wall, a short wall that, that designates the temple grounds. And that's called the mesocline in uh, Greek. So, mesitas, the mesocline. Very interesting. In one case, it's a wall. In the other case, it's an emissary, a mediator. But in any case, it is a amid, amid the people. I gave you this word before because uh, B-B-A-I-A. -A. It's, it's from, let's see, B B -bas. B B S. What's the basis? Basic word, basis. Basis, bebeos. Bebeos. This is a word for foot. And the reason I mentioned this word, and I think I think I had these in my box, but intentionally they're bad, so I was going to check to see if they work. You probably can't read it real well. Let me see if this works. I'm going to throw these away, because I was checking to see if they were good or bad. 
any case, the Santa Claus. Says. The reason I want to mention this word is because the word of the day last week was. Let's see if this one works better. No, these are dead. These are throwaways. That's what I want to check. We had a word, para. Para. I think it's parabasis. 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 Remember I told you? I thought that was very interesting because the basis is foot and foundation. Foundation. And para means near. Near. And I said, you know, it's really funny. So I pulled out my Woodhouse to check it out. I want to check out in Woodhouse what Woodhouse said because I'm, this word is confusing to me. In Woodhouse, violation, the violation in Greek, in ancient Greek, in Athenian Greek, is um, para, the main word is para nomos, near law. And I thought that was really interesting too, okay? Paranomos. Now, parabasis is also a form used in ancient Greek for a violation <coughs> near law. And I thought that was interesting. I'm, mm, I think we should be, look at it and see what the context is itself. But for now, let's see, they said basis, basis is a basis means stable, right foot stable. So near stable. Now here, here's how to think about it in Greek as a Greek thinker. Remember we talk about uh, dike sune, right? In balance. If you're dike sune, you are stable. Your basis, right? You have a foundation of some type. You, you may be Balancing, but you're stable. If you are near basis, right? It's like you're near law. You nearly met the law. You nearly follow the law. That's interesting, isn't it? It wasn't that you didn't follow the law, right? But you were near following the law. So this, I think, really reflects Greek culture. You know, at first I was a little confused about this parabasis, but as I think about it more within a Greek, con you know, Greek cultural kind of thought, it makes sense. So let's see what it, what it is in context. So we are at 14, and we had gotten through 14 when we were interrupted by the bell. So if you remember what we talked about with 14, we looked at it, but I had not given you a transcript or a synopsis of the uh, of the text. Let me read it first, 14 in the NIV. How much more then will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself unblemished to God, cleanse our consciences from acts that lead to death, so it may serve the living God. And you remember, the word in Greek is can't be conscience. The word, I'll just remind you of this, the word is sunidesis, the ability to see together. It can't be conscious. So that is a very improper and incorrect translation of the word. Um, see together. And it, but here's, here is my literal, here's a literal translation of the Greek. How much more, how much greater, I put more because that's the word that the Greeks would, would use. How much more the blood of Christ who through the spirit of the ages bore himself a sacrifice without blame towards God, will purge your ability to see off dead toil to minister a living God. Okay, that's the literal. Here's, here's a translation that puts it into more of an English sense. How much greater the blood of Christ, who through the spirit of the ages bore himself a sacrifice without blame towards God, will purge your actions from dead works to the ministry of living God. That's, that's really what it's saying. So compare that to the translation, how much more then will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself unblemished to God, cleanse our consciences from acts that lead to death so that it may serve the living God. The point is the focus of this 
statement is on going from dead works to living works. And this, again, is what I've told you before. When we talk about harmentia, you know, miss the mark, God doesn't... God's point is, yeah, you may miss the mark, but what if you never shot the arrow? Right? I thought about it, though. <laughs> you thought about it, see? But you didn't do it. So turning, what's a dead work? Well, I got my bow and arrow over here, right? I'm prepared. I'm, I'm prepared. But then I take my living works, so I actually put the notch to the bow, and I pull it, and I aim at the target. Now, what if I'm not on the target? I missed the mark, right? But what did I do? I attempted to hit the mark. I turned dead works to living works. Uh, this probably is a faulty analogy, but my point is this. The, the, the thing that we see in the New Testament, coming back to Hebrews, coming back to all of them, is... And this goes back to what I talked about last week. And we actually yapped about it a little bit before class. That is, I don't think the pagans were joyful. I don't think they led very happy lives. And I think the minute Christianity hit them, okay, what is the premier, what is the premier thing they get at festivals? Meat. Meat. And the other thing they get at festivals is wine. Meat and wine. You're looking for as a Greek every, you get 12 festivals, right? And so 12 festivals, 12 times a year, I get some meat and I get some wine. They have a huge wine festival. Well, doesn't that seem like kind of a drag? I mean, you get 12, if you're a Hebrew, you get six of them. Big six. I'm waiting all year to have some meat and wine, and that's the peak of my life. And remember, the Thanksgiving sacrifice, you finally brought the Thanksgiving sacrifice into the temple, and you shared it, and you got to eat all that you wanted to, because all the rest of the year, you're starving. starving. Yeah, you have no meat, you're starving, it's not very happy. I don't think pagan and paganism is a very happy thing. It might, it'd be worthwhile if we had much pagans to ask them, but I don't think they're very happy. We probably could today because paganism is kind of growing in, in our nation, right? We get all these. But, okay, you ever seen a witch with a smile? Glenda. Glenda the good witch? Good witch. But, but the bad witch didn't have a smile at all, and she didn't have any shoes either. You know, I, even Hermione, whatever on the thing, she smiled. She, very, she rarely smiles, right? She has a funny name that's hard to pronounce. Why would you have a funny name that's hard to pronounce if you're a British person? But anyway, okay, she, she doesn't smile, right? She doesn't seem happy, you know? I'm just saying. So when Christianity came in and they said you can have wine once a week, no, they, they had the Eucharist, they had the Lord's Supper, they had, you know, there, there is hope eternal. There's hope after death, there's hope in life. Right. What was there? Okay. I'm gonna I'm gonna touch theological pool, but I'm not gonna touch it very deeply. But but the big deal about last week we talked about we didn't include Brent reminded me of this. You know, when you go talk to your teachers and they're teaching about um, not necessarily theology about comparative religion, what do they say, why do they say man man invented religion? Why did man invent religion according to them? Explain that. Well, Brett said right on, most of the time you hear him say it to explain death. You know, what happens after death. But when we look at animism, Anne's right, but because when we look at animism, the purpose of animism has nothing to do with death. They, they, don't, even, they don't care what happens when you die, you're dead, right? But, or paganism, because they don't really care, you're dead. What are you going to say, Brett? To, to not only explain death, but to help them overcome the fear of death. Right. It gives them a solution. It's your crutch, right? Yeah. That's reason. The modern view, and, and by the way, who, came, who, who coined that? Do you know who coined that? Who coined that? The religion is a crutch to man? Karl Marx! It's in the Communist Manifesto. The opium of the masses. Well, he even wrote more. He said it was a crutch. 
He said, it's a crutch for living because you, you don't understand. And he said, and his answer was, you need to be atheist. Yeah. Look, communism equals atheism. Okay, that's not theological. That's just history. Communists are atheists, period. That's why the Catholic Church, that's why Stalin tried to destroy the church, the Orthodox Church, and couldn't. He created more church members by his purges, but he killed hundreds of thousands, maybe millions of Orthodox believers. The Catholic, the, uh, the Communist Chinese, they don't worry much about Taoism or Shinto. They don't worry about those. Why? They're not true. They don't care. They're, they could be the opiate, but they don't care what the people believe. But they tried to destroy Christianity. It's really funny that they don't care about all these other religions, Buddhism or others, within their flocks, within their folds. But the one they want to destroy is Christianity. Same with today's secular socialists today. The secular socialists today will not care if you bring a Muslim Quran into a into a school and start reading from it. They don't care if you bring. They actually do that. They have like units on Islam and have the kids do the prayers and all the different stuff. If, if my kid were in there, I'd have him out so fast and make your head spin because that's you know. Okay. I'm, I'm going. I'm going down, chasing chase rabbits. But I'm going to say this because it was in the paper today. The paper said the reason we had chaplains, according to Ben Franklin, was because it helped build conversation. No, they had chaplains because every one of them knew the living God and knew that God was the truth, and Christianity is the only truth. There is no other truth. Okay, and that's why we have chaplains that are Christian chaplains for the Congress. I want you to be clear about this. It's not because we want to build conversation, okay? But that's what journalists believe. <clears throat> journalists are not bright, or else they'd be doing something else. Yeah. So there, there's a problem right here, okay? Just say it. Anyway. The, the chaplain's kind of like a fact checker. You go into Congress and he says, no, that's not what it says. Yeah, but he, the, the one they fired just recently was not a fact checker. He was a partisan who was on the wrong side of the of, of God's side, in my opinion. But that's okay. We got a lot of those. If you haven't noticed, right? That's why our church split, ELCA, and and you know because there's a church down there that believes that killing babies is okay. But you know we don't kind of hold to that position. But uh, sorry, that I guess that's not necessarily theological, but that's uh, all right. 15. Sorry, sorry, sorry. For this reason, Christ is the mediator of a new covenant, that those who are called may receive the promised eternal inheritance, now that he has died as a ransom to set them free from the sins committed under the first covenant. Here's what it says in the Greek. Kai, and, dia, for, toto, that thing, cause, dia, he is, this is esti, which is truly he is. The is added, mediator, mediator, mesitas, the go-between. Of the is added, kenios, the fresh, the fresh testament. It's interesting that it's not new. There is a word in Greek for new, but the word is, it, that's used is kenos, which means a fresh, fresh, very interesting, fresh, testament. It's a disposition, and we've talked about disposition before. Um, popos, whatever, how. Whatever, how. It's kind of funny. They took a very interesting Greek word that's complex. Hopos means whatever, now. But they changed it just to that. That. By means. Literally, not by means, it's... Genomai, which means to come. It's a very common word. To, to become of phantos, of death. For, literally not for, but ice. Into, the is added, um, apolustrosis. And I gave you this one before. Apol, apolustrosis. Trosis. I'll get it right. This means ransom in full. Lustrosis is a ransom. Apo, rans this is ransom in full. So the mediator who ransomed in full. Of the, and that's ho, parabasis. Parabasis, the violation near pace or out of step. That word is added. 
under, it's not, okay. They took the word epi. Epi means over. Epi is over, but they made it under. Okay, okay. The ho, first, protos, foremost, diatheke, disposition. They which, it's ho, are called kaleo. Kaleo, we know kaleo, right? Uh, ecclesia, ecclesia, kaleo, to call. Might receive. Okay, might receive. It's our favorite, lambano. What's lambano mean? To take. This is, I, I, I get worried all the time about our translators on this word because um, one of the reasons that we, okay, what do Lutherans say, how do you Lutherans say you get your faith? You receive it. But that's not what the New Testament tells us over and over again. The New Testament tells us that we lambano it, you basically grasp it, you take it. So, all, well, all translations generally have this, because this is NIV, right? It's not written just for Lutherans. But it's really funny that we want it... We want to take the word take and turn it into receive. Mm. What about accept? Because it's sort of an overreaction to works righteousness of Catholicism, do you think? Mm -hmm. I believe that is absolutely, that is absolutely the reason. It is one of the problems, the Martin, the Martin Luther problem is he could not understand, he could not, he would not define the work of faith. John tells us the work of faith, right? Pistis, yeah. The work of faith is salvation. And it's, it's interesting that he would not define that, right? So, yeah, it is a reaction, but I'll let you... The Greek, sa the Greek says that we grasp salvation. We grasp salvation. Which I think is beautiful. That's what lambano means. Lambano means, lambano does not mean that you just pick it up. That you just take it. It means you grasp it. And so, however you want to take it, I mean, that is, this become, that, you know, any further becomes a true theological discussion. But historically, the reason that we've done this is, I think, <coughs> in contrast to the works. However, who uses the NIV translation also? Catholics, yeah. And, and, and it's not, um, Vatican II changed a lot, okay? Vatican II changed a whole lot. Because Vatican II defined salvation not to be through works. Just to be clear, your Catholic brethren made sure. And by the way, how close is is Reformation, not Reformation theology, but Reformation doctrine, which are two different, really different things. We as Lutherans hold to Reformation doctrine, but not Reformation theology. Reformation theology is Calvinism, by the way. So, you know, how closely the Catholics are to that is like, like this close. There's only a couple of things. Transubstantiation, the Pope, the authority of the Pope, are really things that, that separate us today and very little else. So, just yeah. Council of Trent. Yeah, the Council of Trent is still in force and supposedly infallible, and that says a lot of things like you can contribute to your own justification. And now, Vatican II really wiped a lot of that off the map. If you read Vatican II, it's interesting. Mm. Let's put it this way. Vatican II is about this thick, and most Catholics haven't read it, and most of the other world. It's kind of like... Um, if we were doing a class in it, we'd probably go really in-depth into it and dig into this stuff. But you're not supposed to venerate saints anymore. You're supposed to, what's the word? Um, honor. Honor, something like that, yeah. Respect. It, it, it's, it's what we're supposed to show respect for. They still can pray for them or pray, not pray for them. Pray not as an intercessory, but pray as in, if I ask, you, you'd have no problem with me asking Daniel to pray for me, right? So a Catholic would say, why would you have a problem with me asking Mary to pray? Right? She's dead. Mary can't <laughs> No, she's not. She's alive. We believe she's alive and a saint. And we believe, and we don't know the state of saints. Mary, that's what Martin Luther said. 
He says, I don't know if they're in the ground waiting or if they are currently with God, right? But I know in time we will all be with God. And so the Catholics have taken the position that the Lutherans wouldn't, that they are with God. And a lot of other, the, the, historically, theologically, people are of that same opinion. Well, the Revelation makes it sound that way. It does. But I'm just saying, the Catholic viewpoint of honor would be, well, if I ask Daniel to pray for me, why can't I ask Philip? Or you know, Because, by the way, they are now in their perfect bodies, so does, and we don't know. Does that mean they are, um, that we know they're immortal. We are immortal spiritually, right? But are they omniscient to a degree? Are they able to see human affairs, right? So I, I don't know either. I know, and Martin Luther probably didn't either. Do they lobby so. God for you? Huh? Do they lobby God on your behalf? Well, you can't. Registered lobbyists. Right? I mean, if you can, why can't they? I, I, I'm not. I'm not taking either position here. I'm not advocating one or the other. I'm just trying to give you the reasoning, right? So historical reasoning why they they believe that. But it's not just that they can. It's that Mary's prayer is worth more than Daniel's. Yeah. If you read the prayers about Mary and the things that they've she, written through the ages, it's like literally blasphemous. It's it's like worship of her and saying that. God doesn't deny her anything she asks, and all, I mean, it's extreme. Who will be first? Yeah, the but of also it's not, um, most of that, well, I would say almost all of that is not official Catholic. A lot of it's written by popes and canonized mm -hmm. saints, and it's very much. Uh, who will be first in the kingdom of heaven? But remember, we're talking about, and we are literally, we are literally talking about the mother of God. Rather unique. A, a unique human. Now. So does that mean that her prayers are worth more than Daniel's? Probably. I don't know. I can't answer that question. Let's betray your mother. <laughs> I, I can't answer that question. I do know. And, you know, the Anglicans kind of had an epiphany not too long ago where they, they went back to more, not Mary worship, but to more Mary, uh, you know, looking at Mary more in a stronger way because they recognized if you read the Bible, and, and I'm telling you, read it you know, for what it says, especially in the Greek, and you recognize historically the importance of Mary within the context of both theology. Now, we don't believe in the uh, Immaculate Conception. The Immaculate Conception is not Christ, by the way. You know that. The Immaculate Conception is Mary. Mary is the Immaculate Conception, not Christ. I won't go into details about that, but that's, that's just what it is. So we, you know, of course, we would say that's just silly. But if you look back theologically how they got to the argument, you need to read the theological arguments, right, and see why they thought that. Because, by the way, if you want to hold to, um, uh, uh, what's it, sin? Um, what's the basic sin thing we believe? Or, or if, if you want to hold to original sin, to, you've got to do something, you have to do something about Mary's original sin. Or if Christ is born into sin, which means he has original sin. Women don't sin. <laughs> That's probably a good answer. <laughs> like, look, solves the problem. This is one of the reasons I don't like to get into theology very much in depth. Now, historical theology is cool, but even historical theology becomes very difficult. Because as you get more into it, there's more questions. And you say, well, how do you answer these questions? Well, 2,000 years of arguments in Christianity, in Christianity have defined these. I'm not going to take a position either way. I'm just going to tell you what we know, right? If, if the husband or the father does not refute the sin, then the sin is upon the husband or the father, not upon the woman. I don't know about that. You better find yeah, it gets deep. Uh, well, I don't know. You better find a quote over that. Anyway, uh, <laughs> let's see. Ransom in full of the, trend, of the parabases, the violations, that were under, let's see where we are, uh, testament by which they are called, called, call, received, Rambano. The promise, the, okay, it, here, promise is okay, but here we have Epangelia. Ep, 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 Epangelica. Let's see, let me, I got it right here. Epangelia. 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 It's got a funny translation or funny pronunciation. Greek. Epangelia. Epangelia is the message of the gods, right? So Epangelia 
It's not just a promise. It's the Evangelia. It's the message from the gods. Of ho eternal anios, the anios, the perpetual, it's basically of the ages, clarinomi, the airship, the portion by law, parcel out. So here's what we're waiting for. Here's what it says literally. And through that thing, he is a go-between of fresh, of new disposition, deposition, deposition. Whatever how became of death into a ransom in full of the violation over the foremost disposition who called, take the message from the gods, the perpetual airship partialed out. Okay, so... I know it sounds a little com uh, complicated. Let's try and parse this a little bit and see what it says. And through that thing, that thing, what's that thing? That thing is his sacrifice, right? The sacrifice. That's what it was talking about before. Through that thing, the sacrifice, he is the go-between of a of the fresh disposition. Whatever how became of death, whatever how became of death, into a ransom in full of the violation, that is the, the out of step, over the foremost, the first disposition, who called, take the message from the gods, the perpetual airship, that is the portion partial out by law. So, let's go, let's go to the last part. The, for, the, the first disposition, who called, take the message from the gods, the perpetual airship. So, basically saying that Christ is, Christ is saying that the message from the gods, the message from God, the Evangelia, the Evangelia is the perpetual airship. That's the point, right? Because, and we know this, we've lost maybe the perspective, but what is perspective? What is the Old Testament? It is the revelation of God to man, right? So the first, the Mosaic law was, who gave it to him? God, God did. It's, it is God's, the first deposit, the first that was a Mosaic covenant was given to man from God. It is God's, Right? So it is the good message from the gods. In other words, that was great. That, that was the perpetual airship that we're talking about. And that airship, okay, the author is obviously trying to tell us that airship isn't just to the Hebrews, isn't just to the Jewish people. That airship also comes to all of us. Why? Because of the mediator. The mediator in Christ He's a sacrifice. This goes back to the sacrifice we had before. What's interesting here also it says, whatever how became of death. Whatever how became of death. What's the point there? What's interesting is what he's going to go into. <clears throat> well, whatever how became of death, because what happened to the sacrifice? After death, Christ rose. So the sacrifice was made, but the mediator died and then rose again. So, for example, uh, they knew this, but we don't necessarily remember this. What is, what is the, what does Moses promise will happen to you if you don't follow the Mosaic law? Ultimately, you will. Die. You'll die. Yeah, death. That's the promise. Remember that from the very beginning, the promise of why the answer to the question, which is what is very interesting, the pagans didn't really care about, right? And only the Mysterion really cared about. But in the beginning of Genesis, they asked the question. And the question is, why did death come about? And the answer was, because of, because of sin. Because man 
didn't follow what God's law or God had told them. And by the way, it was Adam's sin. It wasn't Eve's sin because the covenant was with Adam at first. But then poor Eve got caught up. It wasn't Eve's fault. She gave it to him, and Adam did it even though he wasn't supposed to. And God got them both because they said, therefore, what the wages of your sin is death, period. Right? And the Mosaic Covenant did not promise anything about death. It didn't take care of the death problem, which is also interesting because remember, what do, the, what all, what do all those uh, uh, teachers, professors, professorettes, all those people in, the, in your colleges, they tell you that religion was, was, was invented because man was worried about death? That's not true at all about Christianity or about Judaism because what were the Jews worried about? Most of worried about sin, which is really interesting. But, you know, there, I, I just want to point this out. If we look at the sacrificial system, right? We look at the sacrificial system, which, which I, I can't let you guys forget about. We can't forget about it. You have ascension. You have the guilt. You have sin. You have the priest. And you have the thanksgiving, right? Sacrifices. How many of those are about sin? Yeah, only two-fifths, right? They were more interested in, and, and this isn't to counter what you said there, Dave, because I think you're right on. They were, sin is the greatest thing they were concerned about in the, in the Mosaic system, in the whole, like the whole Old Testament. The concern is about sin, not about death. Death is just death. But sin is a real issue, right? It's a huge issue. So whatever those professors say, just laugh at them. Go, what? What? Have you ever read the Bible? Don't you know what you're talking about? No, they don't. But that's another thing. So, But you have the ascension sacrifice. They're concerned about approaching God, right? And the sin and guilt, the reason for those is so they can approach God. And then the priest sacrifices so they can approach God because it's it's of the frankincense it's the scent is allows them to um, it, it's not covering their sins but it's it's part of that that sacrificial process that allows them to come into the presence of God and then finally what's the Thanksgiving sacrifice in the you're in the presence of God doing what Thank you. what what eating with the deity you're eating, you're eating a meal. Okay, okay. Uh, to us, okay, we are losing this concept of, of um, what do you call it, um, visiting and meals, right? Back in, in the day, people would go visiting at tea time, 4 o'clock, every day. Every woman was out of her own house or, or in some other woman's house or other person's house <laughs> having tea and visiting, right? And then... If, if they were really wanted to, to, to uh, engage you, they would invite you to dinner. Dinner. supper, right? Dinner, supper. And so the whole point of visiting and hosting and being was this huge communicative human process. This is what the world is about. They come eating and drinking, right? We're eating and drinking with God. That's what the Eucharist is. It's a lot of communication. Well, well, more than communication, we're, we're friends with God. That's cool. But even more, we're heirs. We're part of the family. In other words, okay, um, I know we do this, and we do it rightly, I believe. But if you're an heir to a family, do they usually kick you out of dinner or supper? Go to your room. No dinner for you. They might. Yeah, well, they might, right? And, and you might have a black sheep in your family or whatever, uh, you know, someone that's not, you know, welcome because of their acts or what they do. And the same thing in the church. We will, 
excommunicate and kick people out from the Eucharist, from the thing. And there's, there's nothing necessarily wrong with that, but the point is that most of the time we claim our place in heirship because we're heirs, right? You're not just visitors coming for tea time and they say, hey, you want to stay for supper? Remember the beginning of Hebrews? The whole point of Hebrews at the beginning was the temple of God was a place that you were invited to live to be because you were heirs. And this is continuing that message. So the perpetual inheritance. I think, you know, this this concept of death being the focus. Now, we, we were back in 1400 BC. Now we've moved up to, you know, about, what, 70, 80 AD. That's where we are in Hebrews right now. Maybe after 90, after destruction of the temple. In any case, we are 70 with destruction of the temple. So at least probably after destruction of the temple. Now we're sitting here, and based on our audience, based on our audience, the audience of Hebrews, I told you, we have the Romans, we have the Greeks, we have the Tinotos, we have the, the Jewish Jews of all the other sects. I guess I could include Jews in all Tinotos, and we have the Egyptians. Who's really interested in death? Egyptians. I think, and I'll, go, I'll say it again, I think this document was written to the Alexandrian church, in Hodos, and part of those people in that church were the Egyptians. And what's very interesting is in early, in early religion, the Egyptians are probably one of the first to develop some aspects of Mysterion. Some of the oldest Mysterions come from Egypt, the Osirian Mysterion, for example. You notice they're the ones who are most concerned about that. The Mysterion members of the Romans and the Greeks are very interested. In Teen Hodos, it's part of our DNA. The Jews? What do you think? Sadducees, Pharisees are, right? Yeah. Sadducees, not so much. But remember what we said before in Acts, it says that many of the Pharisees, or many of the Sadducees, the priests, were coming to know Christ. Is there? Oh, it's pretty interesting that the uh, Egyptian eunuch would be choosing Isaiah for that reason. Ethiopian. But pastors, anyway, that he was an Egyptian, high ranking official. Yeah, it's interesting he said Egyptian because I think he meant to say Ethiopian. But yeah, he was, um, a, a matter of fact, in history, hmm. okay, here's history for you. Some of you may know more about this than I do even, but as I understand the church that came from, um, there is a remnant of this church in Ethiopia. And the remnant of this church has very strong Jewish ties, looks very strongly like Judaism, and at the same time, has very strong Christian ties. As a matter of fact, they even translated some of the uh, scriptures, the New Testament, into their own language, which is really interesting. So, um, I believe very, they consider themselves the sons of Solomon. Yeah, they do. When he came up, that she, that, that she was, uh, she gave birth to one of Solomon. So I believe that that's. Yeah, I think they hold that too. Yeah, Dave. Now we we were at last night's service, and and he said the. Ethiopian and Egyptian, he used those So, I mean, it was purposeful. I don't think it was a mistake that he made this morning. So, could could it have been considered administratively the same country, mm -hmm. Ethiopia and Egypt? No, I don't think so, because they had a queen, and they weren't under uh, Greek subjugation. But they did have a strong Jewish contingent, which is also interesting. Um, but that area, I believe, had once been part of Red Egypt, or uh, Black Egypt, um, Red Egypt, whatever. I can't, I, I used to remember all the Egyptian details, but the, the, the southern, it's yeah, a southern Nile. Egypt. It's a southern, southern Nile area, which is Ethiopia, where the um, African Egyptians came from, by the way. Because you know that the, the northern Egyptians are mostly um, uh, Koskoid where the southern Egyptians are mostly, um, you know, uh, black African from that stock. And of course, after the Greeks, 
the Greeks really <coughs> infused. And today they're Muslim. They're not really, um, I don't know if there are even very many remnants of the original Egyptian culture or so so the people. Coptic church yeah. and there's, there's, there are very ancient roots there. True. And of course, they're highly persecuted. And highly persecuted, yeah. Uh, yeah that, that comes along with the... Uh, with uh, dictatorships, right, of, uh, Islamic. of Islamic dictatorships. Yeah. All right. um, 16. In the case, this is where it becomes interesting. You notice it said the thing about death. In the case of a will, it is necessary to prove the death of the one who made it. That's what it says in NIV. 16. Gar. Uh, gar. Signing a reason. Hopu. Whatever where. Whatever where. It's really interesting. We take these very complicated or complex Greek... Um, Constructions, especially the uh, prepositional constructions, or um, what are these words called? Um, these are actually uh, not prepositions, but um, uh, he. He is a pronoun. We, de- we take these very complex pronoun constructions, wh- whatever, where, whatever, where is a pronoun construction meaning relating to a place, and make it into where. Which is okay. I mean, that's kind of English because we don't have a whatever where, but that's all right. Uh, Diatheki, a disposition, is is added. There must. It, it's not there must. It's Pharaoh. Remember, um, we have the word uh, uh, pose Pharaoh or, or uh, anyway to bear bear towards. This is Pharaoh to bear. Also is added of necessity, and it's not necessity. It's anageke, constraint. Constraint. To uh, be Pharaoh, it's to bear. Uh, the is added, Thantos of the test, testator, the dia the, theme, dia theme, to put apart. Uh, anyway, <clears throat> here's what the literally says assigning a reason, whatever where a disposition to bear of constraint, death of the Testator, and I and I put it in the Greek thing. The point of this is, okay, the NIV is not too far off, but assigning a reason, whatever, where there's a disposition, you have to have the death of the testator. You have to have the death of the one who made, the, who the disposition is made about, right? It's not necessarily the one who made the disposition. It's the one that is basically the one who's taken it to court, right, and gotten a disposition. So in a simple sense, this <coughs> they say in the case of a will, that it isn't really a will. Um, I have to explain this again. Okay, a disposition, a disposition, which is what, what this is talking about, a disposition is what is made in a court of law. And so I, as the testator, I'm the one who brings the disposition to a court of law, and I say, judge, make a ruling. And when the judge makes a ruling, that's a disposition, right? And so the disposition is made. It's not the same as a will. Because in a will, as a testator, as the person who does it, I write out my will, and it's affirmed by witnesses, and then when I die, that will becomes, right? And so <clears throat> the disposition here, it's not necessarily saying what it does in the NIV. In the case of a will, it's necessary to prove the death of the one who made it. Assigning a reason, whatever, where, a disposition to bear of constraint, that death be put on the one who dispositioned. Now, you you say I may be splitting tax here a little bit, or splitting hairs a little bit, but I'm not meaning to. I just want to say this, that the point of the disposition, the point of a will is somebody dies. Inheritance. Right? Inheritance. they got to die. By calling it a will, our our translator has put it into a common English kind of construct for us. But that's not exactly what the Greek is telling us. The Greek is telling us that if a disposition is a disposition according to a death, 
then you got to do something about it when the when the person dies. So I'm not mean as but hairs here. What I'm trying to make you see is, uh, does a disposition have to be about death? No. No, it doesn't have to be about death. In other words, by the way, was the Mosaic Covenant about human death? Did, it, did any of this help you when you died? Egyptians would help you, maybe. Well, no, no, I'm talking about the, the mm -hmm. sacrifice. Mm -hmm. It wasn't about death, right? It was about being reconciled to God. Being reconciled to God, whatever that meant within the concept, right? The disposition, the original, the first disposition was about how should you be reconciled to God, which is obviously an important thing. You don't to, have to die to be reconciled. And by the way, how did that resonate with these other people? What do they want? They want to, they want to be reconciled to God. Yeah, isn't this kind of funny? I mean, to me, this is kind of funny. Because, you know, the Roman gods, would you like to be reconciled to a Roman god? No. How about to a Greek god? No. How about to an e Egyptian god? No. no, thank you. These guys were all nutheads. No way. But isn't it interesting that it resonated with the people that they wanted to be reconciled? And it wasn't a reconciliation about death. The Mysterions tried to answer the question of death. Once you finally got to Mysterions, you began to ask, people began to ask, what about death? That's really where it came from. And so that's why I mentioned, you know, the Egyptians were some of the, you know, originators of the Mysterion concepts. People were concerned about death. <clears throat> but the Mosaic Covenant wasn't necessarily concerned about death. It was concerned about how you were living. And there's so much more of this. I need to say this. Uh, next week, I hope I am here. I may be gone uh, you might take a look and see if stuff's on the board. I'll, I'm here. I'll try to inform the church if I know for a fact, but I may be leaving on Sunday or Monday, so I don't think they reconcile which. The Air Force doesn't stay open on Sundays. You just don't do that. Anymore. So anyway, I don't think they're going to be able to get an airplane into the into the base. But thank you, Father, for your word. We pray you look after us this week. In your name we pray. Amen. It's interesting that we 